Lily Neustadtl, as I was then, and it was taken um, around 1932 uh, in Berlin. My first theater experience was uh, quite a traumatic one. My father, who was very fond of opera, and I became very fond of opera, he took me to uh, Troubadour at one of the big, I don't know whether it was Staatsoper or, or which one, I can't remember, and we went to that. And funnily enough, I don't remember my mother coming. She may have been there, I don't know. And th there was a, a long pause after the first interval, or, or even before that, uh, they interrupted it and they said the Führer was coming to watch the performance, Alle Juden raus, all Jews out. And my father sort of just took my hand and said, sit still. And he waited till it was all dark, and then we left. That is a photograph of my sisters and myself taken in 1921, when I was three years old. It was taken in Schwerin. I think I visited all the studios in Hamburg. There was one left, Hofi, that was the wrong side of the Alzer, number seven. I arrived, I walked up five flights of stairs. I think there was a lift, but I didn't dare to take it. And there was a woman opening, blonde, blue-eyed, very German-looking. And I said, very shy, I'm looking for an apprenticeship. Oh, I said, but I don't think you will take me, I'm Jewish. The woman said, you are Jewish? Because I didn't look at blonde and blue-eyed, too. She said, are you really Jewish? I said, yes, I, I, I am Jewish. And of course, you don't have to take me, <laughs> because she was so nice. She said, I am taking you. I really didn't want an apprentice. Now I take you. This is what I want to do. And that is why I had the most marvelous apprenticeship. Uh, these are the people who were the committee of the Jewish Sport Club in Magdeburg, Hakor. Hakor and Maccabi will change the name. And uh, all of them went later to Israel. I was a person who was sent, and I must say it with the permission of the German authorities, the Gestapo. I was sent from Berlin regularly to Paris, to Brussels, to Amsterdam, to Stockholm, to Copenhagen, to London. If I consider today, I was a young boy almost, how I did it, and uh, they didn't give us much money to do this. But I went into these places to persuade farmers, particularly farmers, in all these places. London was a special situation but I refer to other, these other countries, Western countries. Uh, we persuaded farmers to say that they are prepared to take a boy or a girl from Germany to work with them on their farm in order to save them. Nineteen hundred and thirty eight in the Oranienburger Straße. It was one of the last loud weddings sort of thing. I I won't know whether it was the last one, but one of the last, definitely, you know. And we were only allowed to have thirty people at home. And I think I had to go to the police to particularly mention it that there will be thirty people on that particular evening in our house because as they checked everything and made sure that the Jews not concentrate sort of too much, you know. And it, it, it was very nice, really, but it, it 
the, the, the atmosphere was not particularly so beautiful and wonderful, you know. That's my father, Felix Pulzer. It must have been taken in the autumn of 1917, uh, when he was 18, uh, having just left school. Uh, and he is there as an officer cadet uh, of the Austro-Hungarian army. Uh, what does stick in my mind is Kristallnacht. And that was very unpleasant, very unpleasant indeed. Something like ten or a dozen stormtroopers just invaded uh, flat. This was late afternoon, uh, looted everything they could lay their hands on, even to the extent of grabbing a necklace that had been that was around my sister's neck, and of course carted off my father and grandfather to the Gestapo headquarters in the Schwedenplatz. But fortunately, they emerged unscathed. Unfortunately, uh, I saw the synagogue burn on the 9th of November 1938. And then they took me on the day after. Well, after my, after I, my, uh, the, 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 the firm that was taken over, who I worked for as a, as a cabinet maker, I uh, worked as a driver at all my ex boss's car, you see. And uh, they stopped me in the street and said, are you Jewish? Yes, out. And uh, I said, well, it's not my car. I said, never mind, it's not your car, you're out. So uh, and that was it. So they took me to police headquarters and uh, eventually we were taken to Bochumark. This is a picture of myself and schoolmates from the Jewish school taken in 1938. At the end of 1937, we decided that it was no good. One could see what was going on. And um, my father uh, was vouched for by um, Sir Henry Dale, who was a very eminent British scientist. And he came to England and he had to take all his medical exams again uh, in order to eventually get a license to practice. And um, eventually in 1938, six weeks before Kristallnacht, um, it was just my mother and myself at home, we came to England. This is um, a picture taken in Vienna. On the left, my father, my younger brother, my mother, myself, seven years old, and my older brother. The journey I also will never forget in my life. I was in a compartment with nuns, and I was the only the only other person, all the others were nuns. And on the border coming to England, um, we stopped, the train stopped, and on the loudspeaker uh, was announced all Jewish people collect their luggage and come out for a certain <coughs> inspection. So I was going to get my case down, I only had two, one case, two cases, get my case down. And one of the nuns put her arm around me and said, you're not going out, you're staying with us. And I said, but I'm Jewish. So she said, you're staying with us, you don't go out. So I was sitting down and then on the gangway, there were a few men um, led by a tall SS man and he passed by and looked at me and looked again and winked and gave me a lovely smile and passed on. So I was safe. Looking out of the window, we had to stop a long time. All the Jewish men, men, women and children 
with one or two cases, were walking down a line. So, that was so heartbreaking. They never came back. And they all had permits to go to England. This is a picture of uh, the boys of the yeshiva in Fulda, which was taken in 1938. Uh, now, I'm on the top row, third from left. And my teacher is the old gentleman, Mr. Jochnowitz. We were waiting every day. We should hear that uh, our application to uh, join Yeshiva was accepted. And in the end, the one from Manchester came first, as I was, as I was hoping for. And then we had to get, as soon as possible, we had to travel to Frankfurt to the English consulate in Frankfurt to get an entry visa here, which we got, but there were a lot of people there. Everybody was trying to get out, and we got that. And when I got that, my father thought, it's, uh, it's not very nice, a boy and traveling on its own, never been out of, from home very far before, to on a long journey to England in those prevailing circumstances there. We thought I'd better join a kinder transport, which I did. And it was of immense help to me. And it was a tiring journey. I remember once we went, it was a hot June day and no food, except a bit what my parents gave me, some sandwiches, a long journey. There was a stop at the border, Dutch border, of course. But as soon as we came over, over the border, the first stop, there were tables with nice fresh drinks. And it was, as I say, a machaya to have a fresh drink there after such a long time. This photograph was taken about a week before I came to England on the 27th of June 1939. On the left is my father, Abrasha Bogdanov. Sitting next to him is my mother, looking very sad because she knew I'd be leaving soon. In Harwich, we got on the train to London. And in London, we were taken to a hall. And I can't remember the name of the hall, but in that hall, we were collected by the people to where Ever the children were going and it was uh, Mr. Clemens' sister who picked me up in the hall and put me on the train to Manchester and when the train arrived at Piccadilly station Mr. Clement was waiting there for me and then took me home on the bus to Horton Green and they'd prepared a lovely room for me a lovely room all to myself it was so Wonderful, suddenly to have a lovely bedroom of my own. <laughs> they were an absolutely wonderful family, Mr. and Mrs. Kemp. They were a Quaker family, but they made no attempt to convert me far from it. For the Jewish high holidays, for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur and Passover, they always sent me to Jewish families in North Manchester. We arrived here Wednesday night at Liverpool Street Station at 2 o'clock. From there, he divided up the men and the women on the station, straight away. And we had to go to the Rautenhaus, which was an Obdachlosenasyl, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, down an outhouse sort of thing. We stayed, we stayed there for one night. And then we had three coaches waiting outside the next morning. But we, we arrived in the Rautenhaus, I think, at 3 o'clock or so, so practically we didn't sleep, you know. We had a cup of tea quickly in the morning, and then we went out to our coaches. And I must say that all the people from the East End at the time, there must have been God knows how many women there who gave us grapes, cigarettes, chocolate, apples, and it was unbelievable. And so then we arrived and went to the Kitchener camp. And we all stayed there. That was at the beginning of September. Sunday the war broke out at 11 o'clock. 
And uh, we had really a lovely time as such. The weather was beautiful. We had something to eat. And I looked after my children, well, my pupils. I arranged on it on a Shabbat and kept them going. Another Jewish girl came two weeks after I was there. She came from Berlin, from a family, just a mother and she, no father, and she was used to working. And we too always laughed about when mice and rats ran under our feet. And I had to empty the chamber pots, which they all used. And then we laughed about it. But when I was alone and came, I did not laugh. I didn't know chamber pots existed. We all used the toilet. <laughs> so anyhow, the work was terrible. And the men saw us. He came, no key at the door up in the roof, and it was icy cold. The wash basin which I had the water was frozen. I couldn't wash. It was so cold that there was no heating in the attic rooms. I got in touch with the Czech club in Lund through London. They told me, yes, there, there is a Czech club here, and they'll send one of the girls and form her to come and see me, which she did, and so on. And I stayed at first in a, host, in a Jewish hostel where I again disgraced myself because I ate some milchige food with a, knife, with, a, with a meat knife or whatever. I just didn't know any better. And I didn't like it there um, at all. It was, there were about six of us sleeping in one room, all the girls, and the boys kept coming in in the night and I didn't appreciate that. In 1940, on my 16th birthday, when I came home from school, uh, the lady next door, who was in the WVS, came with a power of arrest and took me away to be interned, leaving my parents behind. And um, they took us to a place in Derby, where we stayed overnight. And then they took us to Liverpool. Liverpool Lime Street, when we emerged, angry crowds lining the street because there were these terrible Germans coming out of the station and we were marched to the docks where they had opened um, an old sailor's home that hadn't been used for five years and they kept us there overnight. And it was just terrible because there was some flooding, and we had filthy, dirty mattresses. There were no, there was no food. But oh, I forget. As we marched, as we were marched to this place, the uh, local Liverpudlians were throwing stones at us because they were ignorant. They didn't know. They thought we were all Nazis. Anyhow, we got to this place, and I must say, there was, they had policemen there, and there was a very kind policeman, and he went home never forget that, and um, brought me a piece of apple pie that his wife had baked. Just He felt so sorry for me. And the next day we were put on the boat to the Isle of Man. And I went sent to Liverpool, I went across on a boat to the Isle of Man to Peel. Not Douglas, Peel is on the west side, on the other side of the island, where they requisitioned a row of boarding houses on a promenade, and it was uh, fenced off, the whole complex was sent off. And that was very nice. It was a nice summer. It was a very good summer. And it was nice there. We was proper boarding houses there, and the whole promenade was fenced off. And behind the promenade was a tennis court there, and other facilities, and there was a, a hill, and on top of the hill, there were a few more houses there as well. Ma not many, maybe two or three, but mainly there was a row of uh, boarding houses on the promenade. The whole promenade was uh, cordoned off. Not cordoned off, fenced off. Like fencing on around the tennis court. On the one, we used one, one boarding house, the ground floor, as a, as a school, because at that time it was uh, just before Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, not, not long before that. And uh, there we could do, we were on our own, we could do whatever we wanted to do, uh, facilities for tennis, or we had, we brought, we put on 
one we put on plays there on we were some quite some prominent people actors there there were people uh, people not from all over England there who were there there must have been there about 250 people or so I was supposed to be interned and I came with my case to the police station here I think I mentioned this and when I got to the, the police station, still stands. It's the same old police station, five minutes from here. And I lived in Hall Road, also nearby. And uh, when I arrived there, the policeman said, who are you? I said, I'm uh, Ari Leon Hendler. Ari Leon Hendler? Oh, he must be a funny person. The super wants to see you. So the super, I went up to the super on the first floor and said, who are you? I was with, with my case, not with, I'm Ari Hendler, I come to be interned. What did you say? You're the handler? Yes. Well, you go home. They tell me from the home office that you are more valuable outside than inside. So you stay outside. And that's how I was not interned. And I then returned straight away to my office in Woburn House and continued our work. We had these harvesting camps. Now there was a time during the war, every year, we had at least some 3,000 young boys and girls, Jewish boys and girls, who helped farmers with their harvesting. And that was highly appreciated by the government during the war because the the non-Jewish boys and girls were in the army. This is a picture of my brother and me, Eugen and Dorothea Merzbacher. It was taken in Berlin in, I think, 1928. When Turkey entered the war, they locked up all the Germans who were there. So I suppose we might have been just lucky because we didn't have any nationality. We didn't get locked up. But the Turks didn't discriminate very much between Jews or Nazis. Or Germans were Germans. And they sent them all off to two small Turkish towns. And a lot of our friends were affected by this, even though they weren't either Nazis and some of them were half Jews. And I don't know that they locked up any full Jews. That I can't remember, but certainly a lot of half Jews. And, you know, they locked some of them up for about two years. The war was well over and the people were still having to stay. They, they weren't in a prison. They were sent to this little town and they had to fend completely for themselves. This photo is taken in 1924 on our plot in the Grunewald outside Berlin. And the other little boy is my little friend Herbert Eckersdorf. Then as soon as we got to Düsseldorf, they took me to, to an army hospital. And there I was the only Englishman, prisoner of war, and I was in a room by myself, and an eye surgeon came in to examine me, and I said, uh, and he told me that, that I had gone, he'd have to do something to, to remove what was left and so on. Then the next morning, after the, I had to have an operation, then the next morning, uh, the eye surgeon, I will never forget his name, I'll tell you why, a man, he was, um, uh, the eye surgeon was called Dr. Hoffmann. He came in the next morning and said in German, well, good morning, let me look at you, and I answered in English. And he said, no, 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 Mr. Denson. You can speak German perfectly well. You, after all, you spoke German and you're anesthetic. Of course, with an English accent. So, it then flashed through my mind immediately 
that this man cannot be a Nazi because nobody speaks his, his mother tongue with a foreign accent. So by that he gave me to understand that if I spoke German ever, I should always continue to do so with an English accent. My parents were much older. They were uh, as they were when I saw them last, before uh, they disappeared. The only solution which I had is to sleep in the woods. For five years, I stayed in the woods, in a part where the woods going down like that. Every night, the dogs with the light, with the German, used to come through to see. And I used to cover with all the, um, the grass. And underneath, I had the baby with me, with, uh, it was absolutely terrible. That for five years, I was staying in the woods. I used to live with milk. And in fact, that affects <coughs> very much my son's health. That I can't I tell you that it was terrible. My father, Joseph Chilag, uh, and uh, his wife, uh, Aranka Chilag Ni Maya, uh, photo taken in 1922, shortly after their marriage. We arrived at the railway siding, the train stopped. We didn't know where we were, other than from the old German fields, somewhere in the east and all that. And there was a sort of station sign, Auschwitz-Birkenau. So we knew that where we were. Not a place that anybody ever heard of before, but that where we were. Uh, the train doors were opened. We had to get off. Uh, easier said than done. Um, as I said, a number of people died, others were sick. Uh, on the uh, platform, we had to line up. And uh, at the end of the platform, there were a number of SS officers and they were sort of telling people, that you, go that way, you go the other way. And very soon it became evident that uh, more uh, working age people uh, mainly men, we in a much smaller group, and all the rest of the people, old people, children, women, uh, sick people, in the much larger group. Uh, with my father and one of my uncles, the uncle who had the garage on the highway, um, we were in this small group. Uh, we were told that the others are going off to the family accommodation and uh, we will meet up with them once we are uh, so, uh, taken care of and registered and all that in the uh, camp we were going into. After liberation of Buchenwald in April 1945, the U.S. Army established field hospitals and the arrowed uh, part of the photo shows me in that field hospital. I'm one of the lucky ones. I've got to be thankful that this country took me in. And uh, although in the beginning it was hard going, I mean, now that I'm in my old age, I, I'm comfortable. I don't have any money worries. I would think the standard we have reached was the same standard we had when we left the country. And that's really, 
a wonderful thing and I'm very grateful for it, you know. You know, in a long time <laughs> that I'm here, you have lots of um, experiences and um, memories, memories, some good, some not so good, some not so good, but happy ones as well. And now I'm content. I get great pleasure from my grandchildren, and uh, I'm grateful people showing friendship and being kind to me. That's what I really need, kindness, love, to make up for, for all the losses I've had. I have used the phrase more than once that I've fallen on my feet, and I'm very conscious of that. Um, something like 50 to 70,000 refugees from Central Europe came to Britain in the course of the 30s, including the 10,000 children. Uh, not all their histories have been happy, especially if they were older and couldn't re-establish themselves professionally and many of the children were left to their own devices after they left school. So I'm very conscious that my, in inverted commas, success story, which is not untypical, um, has not been universally shared. And I'm very conscious that there are others who are less fortunate than I have been, and that really the distribution of life chances in this world is often a very random business. The only message I can think of is um, the whole reason why we have this interview is to let future generations know what kind of life we had so that they should have a better life and should not have to suffer for all the traumas we had to suffer. As time goes on, the, the memory of those days on the importance of it that will dim with time and on this program will help it keep it uh, in people's minds and hopefully let people future generations have a better life should be a, uh, a better world.